Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming to what's the, the last day of our um, seminar series. Uh, people who've been coming regularly, I thank you very much. I want to thank the audience for making this um, a really great uh, series of talks as, as well as all our speakers. But I do want to also thank all the speakers who've been um, come and spoken. Uh, it's been a yeah, great, great series of talks and I'm very happy to um, introduce Faye Dauka to give our last talk, um, who is Professor of Physics at Imperial College. Um, and today is going to be talking to us about on the topic of if time had no beginning. Um, please, Faye. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you. Also, thank you um, to you and Chris for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I... I'm very glad to be able to commune with you all about um, these these struggles over the nature of the nature of time, the nature of space time, the nature of our world. Um, it is, I find, uh, something of a haven. And I'm speaking personally for myself to be able to to think about these things and feel connected to you all, um, even though we can't actually be together and speak, but I'm looking forward to the future when we can all be together um, and discuss in person. I'm going to, oh, Nick, can I ask you, uh, sh how long should I talk for? And So we have a target of about 45 minutes. If you need yeah. a bit longer, that's okay. Um, that seems Fine. to be about a good time. Could you give me a 10 minute warning? Just before? Certainly, yep. certainly. Just um, and just minutes. one. And while I have the microphone on, I'm about to post the slides into the chat, um, and I think they'll be on Facebook as, as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm going to talk about work that I've done with my student, Stav Zalel, and uh, master's student, Bruno Bento. Bruno is now a PhD student in, in Liverpool. He's moved on from Imperial. Um, and I'll come to the work that we've done together uh, kind of towards the end of the talk. And as you'll see, I've made my talk very conceptual. There's hardly any technical details at all. It, it's made, the as I was running through it, it's made it, uh, uh, I found that I've uh, been very, it's been very difficult for me to, to grasp really technical talks in the last few months. <laughs> So I've tried to make it really non-technical, um, but it does mean that some things that I say, you know, might be, might feel a bit obscure, so, but hopefully we'll have time to discuss and you can ask me um, ask me questions about the details of things that, that I claim. So in standard cosmology and Big Bang physics, it's often stated that time begins at the Big Bang. There's no such thing as before the Big Bang. So why, why do people say that? Well, if we ignore inflation, then the standard cosmology implies that in the past, there's a space-like hypersurface on which the Hubble parameter H, defined to be A dot over A, where A is the scale factor of the universe, becomes one in natural units. And even if, within, if you include inflation, some people argue that there must be such a hyper, even so, there must be such a hypersurface to the past of the inflationary era. When H equals one, that means that there is curvature on Planckian scales. So, and I'm going to call that hypersurface where H is one, um, the Big Bang or Big Bang hypersurface. So there on that hypersurface or then, if you like, the temperature, density of matter, and curvature is Planckian. But actually, interestingly, the curvature is only Planckian in the time direction. And in the space-like directions, it, the curvature is, is ne negligible, very small. In fact, I think something like 28 orders of magnitude smaller than the Planckian curvature in the time direction. And this is the so-called flatness problem. It's, it's a fine tuning problem because why would you, you'd expect everything to be Planckian at the, at the Planck era. Um, okay, so there's general 
although not universal agreement that the differentiable manifold structure of Lorentzian geometry is not a good description of space-time there at the Big Bang, on the, on the Big Bang hypersurface. And there's a singularity broadly interpreted as a breakdown of known theory. And if there's no Lorentzian space-time, then there's no time, there's no before, and that leads to this statement that time begins at the Big Bang. And it's taken forward in quantum cosmology by the, particularly by the proposal that the universe tunnels into existence from nothing to the Big Bang hypersurface. And the no boundary proposal of Hartle and Hawking for a wave function of the universe is based on this heuristic. But there are alternative pictures for cosmology. And in particular, there are what people call cyclic or bouncing or oscillating models. And this is another heuristic that's long standing and attractive when it's been around for a long time. And in the cyclic models, there are there can be finitely many cycles in the past or infinitely many. There are cyclic models with no singularity in which continuum space time is always a good concept. The universe doesn't, doesn't approach a singularity, but it just oscillates um, in, um, in scale factor. In which case there would be no problem with the notion of before. But a more common cyclic model is one in which, which is punctuated by singularities. There's a big bang, and then there's some semi-classical epoch in which space time is described by Lorentzian geometry. And then a collapse phase uh, ending in a big crunch. And then quantum gravity, deep quantum regime, no continuum space time, something, something. And then there's another big bang followed by a semi-classical epoch and then a big crunch, etc. So how do we make sense of, in these models, of the and then, in the absence of continuous, so if this, this heuristic is right, and there's no continuum space-time, the singularities that are between the semi-classical epochs, how do we make sense of this concept of and then? There's no continuum space-time there. So phrase, the question another way, how can one distinguish physically a cyclic model from a model in which these epochs between Big Bang and Big Crunch just, just sort of slip them at the, at the singularities and just put them next to each other in space-like relationship to each other in something more like the conventional multiverse picture. I kind of laughed to myself when I wrote conventional multiverse picture. But what, what does it mean that these epochs are one after the other rather than just sort of side by side? You know, they just all exist space-like to each other. Okay. The causal set approach to the problem of quantum gravity is a framework for exploring these issues. And it's particularly well suited to, to asking these questions, exploring these issues, because in this approach, the concept of causal order that is there in continuum space-time and general relativity survives in the deep theory, though continuum Lorentzian space-time does not. And the main ingredients of this approach are causal order and also fundamental space-time discreteness and the path integral. So those are the sort of three pillars of this causal set approach to the problem of quantum gravity. And let me note here that causal order is a term that's inherited from continuum GR. And what it means is the order relation of before and after. And it doesn't imply causation as in cause and effect, which is lucky because I don't know what that might mean. I mean, I'm glad that it doesn't imply causation because I don't know what causation means. So 
Um, but it, it, when I say causal order and causal sets, the causal, the word causal, overused word, it, it, all it means is before and after. It doesn't mean that some, one thing causes another thing. So this idea that causal order is a more primitive notion than time is an ancient tradition of thought. And if there is causal order in the deep theory, then it doesn't matter that Lorentzian space-time breaks down at the Big Bang. We can still understand statements that involve phrases like and then and before the Big Bang and such like. So let me give you a picture of what that might mean. Well, actually, let's, let, let me tell you a bit more about causal sets before I, before I get to a cosmological picture. So let's get a bit concrete. A causal set is a discrete partial order. And the hypothesis is that space-time in GR is a continuum approximation to a causal set, a very large causal set. Uh, our observable universe is a causal set with about 10 to the 240 elements. Um, and that is the space-time volume of, of the observable unit, uh, observable universe in Planck units. Okay, so let me direct your attention to this picture here on the left-hand side, this diagram here on the left-hand side. This is an example of a causal set. It's very tiny, um, nothing like our universe, clearly. It has six elements, which, uh, and I've labeled the elements with the integers um, zero through five. And you might think of those elements actually being those integers, or you might think of those elements as being some other kind of mathematical object and being labeled by those integers. Um, I'll come to that in a minute. So it's a set with six elements and a binary relation, an order relation on those elements. And that is indicated by the, this, is, this picture is called a Hasse diagram. And it's a diagram in which the elements are labeled by these nodes. It's this picture is of a graph, the nodes of the, uh, of the graph. And the edges are denoted by the lines and the arrow is because the order is a direct, is, has a direction. So in this diagram, zero is before one, one is before three, one is before five, zero is before two, which is before five, and four is before five. And there are other relations which are not drawn in the diagram, which are implied by the, by the relations which are shown. So zero is before five, but no edge is drawn because it can be, um, it's implied by the fact that zero precedes two, which precedes five. So the relation, the order relation is transitive. So that's an example of a very simple causal set. And in a Hasse diagram, you, the direction of the lines drawn on the page implies the order so that after is at the top and before is at the bottom. So if I deleted the arrow, one can and usually does delete the arrowheads on the arrows so that it's just the, um, the, the position on the page which tells you what the order, order relation is. So before is always below and after is always above. Okay, whoops, sorry. This example is just a finite example and we're going to think about infinite causal sets um, as well. And the condition that a causal set satisfies is that it's locally finite, which means that between any two elements, there's only finitely many elements in the order. So obviously this is a finite causal set, so obviously it's locally finite. But in an infinite causal set, you can choose two elements and ask which elements are in, in between them in the order, which are above the lower one and below the, the upper one. And the answer will be there was, um, just some finite number. I mentioned that we can think of these elements as actually being integers or being labeled by the integers. And I'm just going to, for definiteness, say that 
the ground set, what's, what people call the ground set, the actual elements of the causal set are going to be integers just for concreteness. And I'm also going to adopt the convention that the order relation is compatible with the usual order of the integers. And that's also called a natural labeling. So you'll notice here that um, if two elements are ordered, so one and five are ordered, then the smaller integer is below the larger integer. And that's always the case. So I couldn't have labeled this top element here by one and this element down here by five, that would not have been compatible with the, with the convention that, the, that our causal sets are naturally labeled. We also adopt a principle which presumably is what underlies or gives rise to general covariance in the continuum theory. And it's the, it's the principle that the labels or the identity of the causal set elements has no physical meaning. And the only physical content of a causal set is the order relation itself. So this causal set over here is isomorphic in its order relations to this causal set over here on the right. So you can see that this is not this element here is one and this is zero. For, so th these are just different numbers. So it's a, it, if you like, it's a different set. Um, uh, sorry, it's the same set with, but with different order relations on them. But they're isomorphic. There's a map between them which preserves the preserves the order um, preserves the order. And the principle of general covariance says that this it, this causal set is physically the same thing as this as this causal set. So in some, uh, strictly, one is considering order isomorphism classes of causal sets as the physical entities. I want to introduce a bit of notation here which I'll use later on, and that is minimal and maximal elements. Minimal elements have no past. So in this left-hand causal set, zero and four are minimal. Maximal elements have no future. So five and three are maximal elements in this causal set. And given any continuum space-time, mg, there exist causal sets, c, and this less than sign stands for the order relation, C less than, or C precedes, which the continuum manifold approximates. So given any continuum space-time, there are causal sets that, um, that can underlie that continuum space-time. There are causal sets which encode the continuum geometry um, well enough so that you can say the continuum is an approximation to it. And strictly speaking, that's a conjecture in causal set theory for which we have by now a lot of accumulated evidence. However, most causal sets are not manifold-like in this way. If you just pull a causal set, a, a, very, a large causal set, so let's say of 10 to the 240 elements out of a bag of all causal sets of 10 to the 240 elements, then it will look nothing like a manifold. So most causal sets, are not manifold-like, they have nothing, they don't have a continuum approximation. Okay, so that allows us to construct a causal set which can make sense of the idea of before, even when general relativity breaks down. So this is an example. So this, I'm going to give a series of three examples. So. So this is an example one. This is an example of a causal set in which the universe has a beginning. There's a big bang and one continuum epoch, let's say our, our um, approximately FRW space time. So the causal set is represented by this orange blob here. Um, it has a diagram like in the sense that the past is down at the bottom and the future is up at the top. Um, so down here is before and up here is after. And this causal set has a number of minimal elements. Let's, or they could just be one. And 
on top of those minimal elements, there's a, a portion of the causal set which is not manifold-like, some non-manifold-like business is going on. And then there is some uh, either region of the uh, slab of the, of the causal set or maybe a single anti-chain of unrelated elements which stands for the Big Bang, after which the causal set is such that there, it's well approximated by a continuum space-time, say an FRW um, space-time. So this is one individual causal set which has these different regions. There's the min level of minimal elements, which is the beginning. There's a bunch of stuff happening which is in the deep the deep theory, which has no manifold-like interpretation. There's a transition, let's say, which is designated, uh, designated by the Big Bang, between that non-manifold-like deep stuff and the epoch of um, the, the continuum epoch, which is approximated by a continuum. OK, so that's possible. We can construct such causal sets. The second example is a bouncing universe with a beginning and with many epochs. And here I want to stress that the ground set is the natural numbers. Um, and the, the, this orange thing again is the causal set, single causal set. And there's one minimal element of the causal set. And that is zero that's the that's the number zero so the ground and all the other elements of the causal set are the other other natural numbers greater than zero so that's the origin again uh this region of the causal set inside this rectangle is a continuum epoch uh let's say it's approximated by some continuum manifold mg and between the origin and the beginning of the continuum epoch, there's again some non-manifold-like causal set stuff going on here. It transitions at a big bang hypersurface into this continuum epoch. And then there's a big, later on, there's a big crunch. So another hypersurface, another transition between continuum epoch and non-manifold-like epoch that ends in again a single causal set element um, and that's known in the mathematics literature as a post it's an element in a partial order such that all other elements are either before it or after it or they're either below it or above it so this this element here is a post and then after the post there's another non-manifold like um, non-manifold like era then there's a continuum epoch ending in a big crunch and there's a non-manifold like bit ending in a post and then the post um, blows up again into a non-manifold like um, uh, era and so on so that's another causal set that um, we can construct so the oh and i should mention here in this um, causal set, every event or every element of the causal set has a finite past. So let me choose an event, an element in this uh, continuum uh, epoch here. How many elements does it have in its past? Well, its past includes the post. And between it and the post, there'll be finitely many elements because this is a locally finite uh, partial order. And then between this post and that post, again, there are finitely many elements in here. So each epoch from post to post has finitely many elements. So the, 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 um, every, every element of the causal set has a finite past. This is a past finite causal set. And that is, I'm going to use that as, being synonymous with the universe has a beginning. The, the causal set is past finite. Every element 
has a finite past. That means the universe has a beginning. And that's also synonymous with the ground set being the natural numbers. These are all the same. Saying that the ground set is the natural numbers is the same thing as saying that every event has a, past, a finite past. Oops. Right. Now, this picture is almost the same as the one before, except this is a bouncing universe with no beginning. So instead of the, oops, so I should not delete that. That's not the beginning. Cross that out. So here's a post, um, but it's not the beginning. It has a past. So this causal set stretches up into the infinite future and down to the infinite past. In this case, every event has an infinite past. There's just an infinite set of, of um, continuum epochs, each one beginning in a big bang, ending in a big crunch with posts in between them all. And in this case, the ground set is Z, the whole of the integers. So this post, for example, in the middle here, that could be zero. And then all the elements down below will be the negative integers and all of the elements above the, that post will be the positive integers. So uh, in this case, every event has an infinite past. However, it's n and, and in this case, the ground set is Z. However, it's not the case that those are synonymous. There can be causal sets whose ground set is Z, but which in which every event doesn't have an infinite past. So for example, you could just have an infinite anti-chain that's just a countable number of disconnected elements. They could just be the integers. So that's a, that's a causal set with a ground, an infinite causal set with ground set the integers, but every event doesn't have any past or future at all. So it certainly is not, it, it's not past infinite. So this, but this causal set that I've depicted is, does, is past infinite and its ground set is set, the integers. Okay, so let me summarize so far. The, I've just talked about kinematics, just causal sets that, that you could just uh, write down. Well, not the infinite ones, but the, so causal, they, the causal set, um, paradigm has a structure to accommodate universes with continuum regions and deep structure regions that resolve singularities in the continuum theory. Universes that have a beginning, whose ground set is the natural numbers. Universes that do not have a beginning, whose ground set is the integers. Universes that undergo cycles of expansion and collapse, continuum epochs punctuated by continuum singularities. So I just want to stress those the regions of the causal set which are not manifold-like, they correspond to singularities in the continuum theory. They can't be, they're, they're not included in general relativity. General relativity doesn't describe those. And oh, I can't help, uh, I can't resist mentioning universes where a black hole singularity, which you can think of as a localized big crunch, is followed by a new continuum epoch or baby universe in a sort of realization of the idea of cosmic natural selection, uh, Lee Smolin's idea of cosmic natural selection. And in all of these cases, the causal order of the causal set, this notion, fundamental notion of before and after, allows sense to be made of one thing after another. So it's the, the, the structure of the, of the epochs following on one after the other make, is is accommodated, is allowed, I and mean, is natural in the causal set, causal set structure. Right, well, that's all very nice, but are these models physical? In other words, do they happen? What about dynamics? And the dynamics of causal sets is a huge frontier in our current understanding. And so far, the dynamical models that are best worked on, best understood, about which we know the most, are classical models. But not classical models in the sense of classical mechanics, they're classically stochastic models. 
So they're classical in the sense that there's no interference, there's no quantumness in that sense, but they are not deterministic, they are stochastic and random. And the class of models that's best understood, best worked out, and most interesting so far is a class called classical sequential growth models um, of Rideout and Sorkin. And they produce by fiat past finite causal sets. So causal sets which have a beginning. So it's a, each, cause, each classical sequential growth model is a stochastic process that grows a random causal set and it grows it on the ground set, which is the natural numbers. There's a beginning and that's built in to the, to the model, to the way the model is defined. The dynamics respects conditions called discrete general covariance and Bell causality. I don't have too much time to say anything much about Bell causality, but discrete general covariance can be understood by considering this particular six element causal set here. It's labeled in a particular way um, and has a, a certain probability within any particular this classical sequential growth model. And discrete general covariance is the condition that the probability of this causal set labeled in a different way is the same. It's equal, those two probabilities are equal. So there's no, the, the dynamics does not distinguish this causal set with the same causal set, but labeled in a different, uh, labeled in a different way. Okay. The simplest case is called transitive percolation. Uh, you can ask me later to explain this comment here, but transitive percolation is, is the simplest possible um, classical sequential growth model in which each element, each new element that, um, that, uh, that comes into being is chooses to be above each of the already existing elements with a fixed probability. And with probability one, transitive percolation grows a bouncing universe with infinitely many posts. So this picture here is a good dis reasonable description of the causal set that grows from a transitive percolation model, um, except that we don't think, it seems unlikely, we don't know for sure, but it seems unlikely that the, um, there's a continuum epoch in, the, um, in between the posts. So that with probability one, there are infinitely many posts in a transitive percolation um, cosmology, but we, uh, uh, yeah, but I'm not, I don't think any of us actually, um, have much confidence that we're that transitive percolation gives rise to continuum like um, uh, manifold like um, causal sets in between posts. Okay. Now, what can we say about a causal set that grows in a classical sequential growth model? Well, we want to make statements about this causal set that are covariant, that don't depend on the labels, that, don't, that um, don't refer to the labels. And the set of statements, one large set of statements that one can make about a causal set that doesn't depend on labels are the so-called stem statements. So what's a stem? Well, a stem is a sub-causal set which contains its own past. So if you look at this causal set again, then this three element causal set, which we call the lambda, is a sub-causal set of this causal set, which contains its own past. So zero, two, and four form a lambda, and it's a, um, all the elements that are to the past of zero, two, and four are also are already contained in that in that suborder. So that's a stem. And if you look carefully, there's this three chain is also a stem, three, one, and zero. That's the stem. Um, and so is this what we call the L, that's another three-element causal set. Um, so 
one, zero, and four, that's a suborder that is, contains its own past, so that's a stem. But these are not stems. There's no three, there's no um, three antichain, which is a stem, and there's no V, that's another three element causal set. That's, that um, that's not a stem. So you might think, well, one, zero, two is a suborder that's a V. It's true, that is a suborder that's a V, but the past of two contains four. So zero, one, two is not a stem because it doesn't contain four. So this V is not a stem. So we can make a statement such as the causal set that grows contains the lambda as a stem. And that's a so-called stem statement or stem event. And it will either happen or not happen in a um, given run of one of these um, classical sequential growth models. It's also measurable. That means that it's, a, uh, it's in the event algebra that's generated by the, by the, um, by the dynamics. And there's a theorem which is essentially the solution to what one might call the problem, what becomes of the problem of time in, or the problem of covariance in classical sequential growth models, which is that all covariant events in the event algebra are about stems. So these stem statements, which are things like the lambda is a stem and the V is not a stem, those sorts of statements exhaust the event algebra of covariant um, statements that you can make about, um, about this growing causal set. However, in the dynamics, in the dynamical, in the description of the classical sequential growth models, the, the dynamics is defined in terms of a process in which, whereby the, the causal set elements acquire labels. So the causal set dynamics is described by a process of, of causal set elements coming into being. And the, the description of the process endows the causal set elements with labels. But the labels are, are not physical. So the question is, can you do better than that. Can we define a dynamics for past finite causal sets which are covariant? And the, uh, the answer is you can go somewhat in that direction by defining a, a framework in which you never need to, for a dynamics in which you never need to talk about labels at all. Um, and I, in view of time, I'm going to skip over that and uh, we might come back to come back to it later. So uh, I'm just going to say that we we can define a structure in which a dynamics can be defined, which doesn't refer to labels at all. It just refers to the things like this, the unlabeled causal set and unlabeled stems. Okay. All right. So as I said, the causal the classical sequential growth models for growing causal sets grows past finite causal sets. Those are causal sets with a beginning. So they can't even address the question of, can the universe have an infinite past? They just, they just don't. They don't, give, they don't allow that at all. So with Bruno and Stav, I um, started to explore the idea of, of dynamical models that can grow causal sets on the ground set of the, the whole of the integers, so positive and negative integers. That, and causal sets that may or may not have a beginning, but at least the possibility is there. And the proposal, which when you first hear about it, sounds pretty hokey, is that the causal set grows by a growth that alternates between adding an element to the future and then adding an element to the past. So in this causal set that I've drawn here, the Causal set starts with zero, and then because zero is a positive number, apparently in France, the next element that's that's born is a negative integer, so that will be minus one. So minus one is born, and it's born to the past of, of zero. This is all stochastic, so this is one particular causal set that might grow with some probability. 
And then one is, is um, added, and then minus two is added, and then two is added, and then minus three is added, and then three is added, and you alternate adding negative integers only to the past and positive integers only to the future. You lose the, pos the potential in this model for the identification of the growth process with the passage of time, I think. I don't think that even I can't make sense of the idea that, that time passes both into the future and into the past. And we have a theorem that says that the sample space of this dynamics is indeed the set of all causal sets that um, has ground set the integers. And it breaks up into three sorts. Um, either the causal set is past finite, but then it has to have infinitely many minimal elements, or future finite, in which case it has to have infinitely many maximal elements, or it can be past and future infinite. It becomes very hard to define a condition of Bell causality, which was one of the physical conditions that went into the definition of the classical sequential growth models. Um, and so there's no analog of the derivation of classical sequential growth models. This is just a framework for such models and there's no, um, there's no particular class of model that, that has been identified that is particularly physically interesting. However, we, what we, couldn't, we can do is just adopt the alternating CSG probabilities. So what you do is you add causal, the positive integers are added as if this were a CSG model, and the negative integers are added by just standing on your head and pretending that the causal set is order reversed, and you add the negative integers as if time is running backwards. And if you do that, then you find that, that the only variety of CSG model that gives you a dynamics that satisfies discrete general covariance, that is that the probability of this causal set um, is, doesn't depend on its labeling, is transitive percolation. So only if, this, if you do alternating transitive percolation do you get a dynamics which satisfies discrete general covariance. However, what you do get with probability one, with, with this alternating transitive percolation, you get a past and future infinite bouncing universe. So you get a universe which has infinitely many posts, which is past infinite and future infinite. However, now there are no stems in alternating transitive percolation because the universe is past infinite. So I should have said a stem is a finite um, suborder which contains its own past. So there are no finite suborders that contain their own past. And so the question becomes in this world of, in, of alternating transitive percolation, what can we talk about? What are localized covariant properties of a past and future infinite causal set? And what we have, what Bruno and Stav and I have focused on or come up with are, is the concept of a convex set. So this is a generalization of a stem set. It's a suborder such that between any two elements of the suborder, anything that's between them is also in the suborder. So for example, in this causal set, the suborder zero, minus one, one, and two, that's a convex set because um, if you take any two of those elements and, and then everything that's between them is also in the suborder. So that diamond shape is a convex set within this, um, within this causal set. Now, that seems very nice and plausible and, and makes physical sense, except that we have a theorem, which is that in alternating transitive percolation, every convex set has probability one. That means that if you ask in alternating transitive percolation, will I get a diamond, a four element diamond as a convex set? The answer is yes. And the answer is yes for any 
finite suborder as a convex set. Say, so will I get this 10 to the 240 element causal set with all these causal relations? The answer is yes, with probability one. In fact, you'll get it infinitely many times with probability one. So in transitor percolation, if you just limit yourself to convex set questions or statements about the structure of the causal set that you grow, there's no discrimination possible at all. All the causal sets look exactly the same as far as the convex set questions are concerned, because the answer is always yes. So in transitive percolation, the beginning is an anchor without which covariant statements, such uh, the covariant statements of convex set um, inclusion have no, uh, they don't have any purchase. There's, not, there's no discriminating that you can do between one causal set generated by alternating transit percolation and another causal set generated by alternating transit percolation. They all look the same as far as the convex sets are concerned. And Similarly to what we did with past finite causal sets, you can go covariant with all of this. You can construct a framework in which you never need to refer to the labels at all. You can grow causal sets in a way that doesn't refer to any particular labeling. And again, I'm going to, for, um, in view of time, I'm going to skip over that, um, that part and just end with these um, thoughts. So is, are there di viable dynamics for past infinite causal sets? And here I have to make a confession. I personally would like to kill them all off. <laughs> uh, I want to show that dynamics of past infinite causal sets don't produce any kind of useful, sensible cosmology. Because I abhor a physical infinity. And if the universe has an infinite past, there is a physical infinity already. It, we, one doesn't have to look or even ask or talk about spatial infinity. There's already a physical amount of stuff that's happened in the past. And that, uh, that yeah, that's, that runs counter to my, to my philosophical um, prejudices. Transitive percol and so here's a reason that that one might want to use to get rid of um, past infinite or say uh, argue that past infinite causal sets can't make sense. So transitive percolation is an important model in the whole CSG framework. There is an argument based on something called cosmic renormalization that Raphael Sorkin made that this CSG framework contains the possibility of self-tuning, a self-tuning um, cosmology where the bouncing um, picture of the universe of cycles um, holds, but each cycle is bigger and lasts longer than the one before. And there's a possibility of, of achieving um, solutions to the various fine tuning problems of, of standard cosmology, including that flatness problem that I mentioned. However, if we include past infinite causal sets, then transitive percolation has to be abandoned because it has no quasi-local covariant observables or physical statements that you can make in its past infinite guise. And if we don't have transitive percolation, then this argument of Sorkin's um, can't be made. However, it's an in, and the reason Stavon Bruno and I continue to work on it is that it's a super interesting structure. The various, uh, particularly in the, um, the part I didn't show you where we are exploring how to make um, the dynamics look uh, uh, intrinsically and fundamentally covariant, some very nice questions arise, which are fun um, and interesting to think about. So, so that although I'd like to get rid of them from a sort of yeah, philosophical point of view, from a sort of technical um, uh, point of view, then they're act actually quite fun to think about. Okay. And then finally, what about the quantum? So no one, I think, 
considers it likely that the universe is a single causal set. And all, everything that I've said so far has been completely classical. And I've been speaking as if the universe is a single causal set. And classical stochastic models, such as um, classical sequential growth models, and these models of, of growing past infinite causal sets, they're just warm warm-ups for the quantum case. And as I said, one of the ingredients for causal set theory is an approach to the problem of quantum gravity is a path integral. So the path integral is the basic framework for a quantum dynamics for causal sets. And the dynamics is given by a sum over histories, which is a sum over causal sets. And the question translates then into which causal sets are included in the sum over histories, past finite or past infinite causal sets. And in some sense, the no boundary proposal comes in here again, because you could think of the, the conjecture that we only sum over past finite causal sets as some kind of no boundary proposal. It's, it's giving you an initial condition or some kind of state um, for, um, for the universe, for cosmology, for quantum cosmology. The interpretation of this path integral framework is a work in progress, but the same concept of event that I used in this talk as being physical statements that you can make about, uh, about the causal set is the same. That carries over into the quantum case in, within a path integral framework because the path integral is a species of measure theory. It's, it's a, a generalization of the kind of the, the concept of a classical stochastic process. So the question then is the same question within the quantum context. Can convex set events make sense or are they useless? Um, um, and can only, or can only stem events which are anchored to a beginning make sense and be useful in a quantum dynamical model? And I'll end there and thanks for listening. I think you'll just have to um, be satisfied with a couple of us who are in the panel to um, applauding. Thank you for a really um, great talk, Faye. That's really interesting. Okay, I'm going to, um, we're gonna use um, as before the raise hand function. So if you have questions for Faye, um, please raise your hand. I will call on you and I will, um, when I call your quest, um, I will promote you to a panelist, which makes you sort of disappear and reappear um, for a second. And the first question is from um, David Bergman, um, who should be there. Are you there, David? Yes, yes, thank you. It was a very exciting talk. Thank you very much. Um, in, in thinking about cosmology, uh, I'm sorry, in thinking about causality from these two perspectives, causal sets and how we as humans view causality, if I understood the talk, and I may not have, we, we have this earlier verse in which there's a sort of discrete causal set percolating up into the smooth manifold that's the world we live in. And in this latter version of causal sets that did not have an ordering, if you impose this idea of quantum mechanics on the causal set where you might have a probability to observe a particular ordering, um, do you think, uh, is there any suggestion that different orderings of events in the early universe would create a smooth um, macro universe that had a different version of causality as viewed by us? Those are, well, I think you converged on a fantastic question there, which I have to say, I don't know the answer to. So how does... The causal, how does the causal order of continuum space time emerge from or relate to the microscopic order relation of the individual causal set histories that are part of the quantum sum over histories? That's how I'd rephrase mm -hmm. your question. And that's, that's, yes, it's perfect. And yeah, <laughs> that's a fantastic question. Um, we don't know the full answer because we don't have a working quantum sum over causal right. sets. 
But because one the, might imagine the evolution the, of universes at the macro scale that had different physics in them, and perhaps the physics we're seeing in this argument might be anthropomorphic in a sense, is just the one that peaks of, uh, in all the histories. Um, but again, without a working model of how to build a macro causality from micro causality, it's, that's highly speculative. Right. So here's one way that, well, so I'm going to describe, say something, some words, whether or not that's satisfactory, you know, I, I don't know, even know whether it's satisfactory to myself. So, but here are some words. So, so we, we already have a heuristic for how classical behavior or approximately classical behavior emerges from a quantum theory based on a path integral. And it's the, it's the old idea that, that originated with Dirac very early on in 1933, was emphasized by Feynman and many others since that, that in the sum over histories, the histories which are close to the classical history mm -hmm. contribute and their con contribute to the to the path integral in a way that their contributions constructively interfere with each other, and that the uh, mm -hmm. the histories far away from a classical trajectory, tra classical history, their contributions are suppressed because their contributions cancel out each other. So there's destructive interference mm -hmm. between the non-classical histories and constructive interference between the classical histories, and we make a prediction of classical behavior from that because of that. Now that's already very heuristic. So even in the continuum mm -hmm. where we think we understand quantum mechanics, that's already something of a heuristic, but it's very widely held and I believe has, is close to the truth. So in the causal set picture, the idea would be that there would be causal sets which all have the same continuum manifold as an approximation to them, a whole bunch of them, right? But it, mm -hmm. it maybe mm -hmm. huge, a huge number of them. And all of those which have the same continuum, continuum space time as an approximation to them, they, their contributions constructively interfere. And we therefore predict that, that we predict that that particular continuum approximation is is an approximation to the, to what is really going on which is fundamentally quantum and and with all the caveats about mm -hmm. whether we understand with we really understand what's going on in the micro world so if that ha turns out to be the case then that might be that might be sufficient or satisfactory to say yes this macro description which is assuredly an approximation to what's going on, but this macro description with its continuum causal order given by the mm -hmm. light cones and um, Lorentzian geometry, et cetera, that is a good approximation to this, this discrete, um, discrete theory in which there are only um, discrete space-time atoms and no continuum at all. Um, and the, the macro causal order emerges from the quantum one in that way. Okay, so those right. that, that's a sketch or based on something which is it, already very heuristic within within the uh, quantum theory. Of but it is, it is satisfactory. Right. It is the direction oh, okay. that we would naturally go in. Um, but one can't help wonder what those other paths might look like. And to, to come up with a ridiculous, imagine uh, crystallizing a, a manifold in which, you know, uh, boiling water created fire rather than fire creating boiling water. It's uh, absolutely absurd, but um, it brings it brings to to light another point. A second question I had in the causal set world: these events. At what point do we imagine that the idea of a particle emerges? Because you mentioned quantum field theory, we think we know how to do quantum field theory in the continuum. But that presupposes that we have this arena on which particles and fields existed. And when I think about causality and events uh, existing, whether it's in this quantum version of a, of a causal set or in the continuum, 
I think of event as being, for example, the electron was here or this photon interacted with this electron. That's because of my upbringing and my education. And I'm sort of um, set in the way of creating an event. But in this version of, of making a continuous manifold from a discrete causal set or even a set without any particular ordering, I, I imagine initially that those events labeled things that made sense to me, but it, it becomes more apparent as I think about it that you can't do that. So is there any idea uh, talked about in this field of research by which after the discrete set creates a manifold, at what point do we imagine that particles and fields made sense to put on it in the first place? Did they exist in the discrete version of the manifold and then also crystallize into what we see? Uh, how does that come into existence in this paradigm? We're keeping an open mind about how oh. matter is going to mm. um, be described within the causal set um, framework. Either we'll need to add extra degrees of freedom on top of the causal set as well as mm -hmm. the causal set. So, for example, we have a model of a a scalar field theory um, on a causal set. So that's that's an example where we're adding extra degrees of freedom. Or it's possible that the, and we have models of particles moving on a causal set, for example. Um, again, you're adding mm -hmm. extra information on top of the causal set. Or it could be that, that there's only the causal set and that matter will have to emerge from the causal set. The, inf the data in, of the causal set will have to contain the mass of degrees of freedom as well as space-time degrees of freedom. Right. And there's some, it, there's a sketch of how that might happen whereby, whereby gauge fields arise as from pollutive mm -hmm. line reductions. Um, I was just going to ask about pollutive line theory. Could it be that or, the... Um, the... And fermions could arise as topological mm -hmm. geons, but they would, they would kick in then at a much higher level that they wouldn't be present in the fundamental discrete causal set, but they Absolutely. would emerge as a sort of intermediate regime between the discrete regime and the and and our, right. our known known physics. But it would be already a continuum regime. So, yeah. Thank you for your question. Kluza Klein theory kind of makes sense for that because it would all the fields that we observe would then be part of the geometry that just came into existence. At least that's that's kind of the direction I would hedge my bet. Yes, that would be lovely. If everything, yeah, if that would be the ultimate unification of matter and space. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, your, your, your answers were satisfactory, even though this, this field is still growing. It's, it's the direction that we kind of naturally think in terms of quantum field theory. But I wonder if anyone's giving serious thoughts, whether that's kind of an anthropomorphic line of reasoning that is we're here, we observed this, we created this. And so now we're creating a cause for the thing that we know we have to see. I suppose that's more a philosophy question. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, David. Thank, um, thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to, yeah, call on um, Siddharth next. I just wanted to say, um, so I, I think people in the audience probably can't, you know, don't get to see the, the line, how, how many people we have lined up. So I've got people in the queue, but I think we still have plenty. Of, you don't have to be deferential to other people. Um, we have a lot, plenty of time for talking today. So please do ask a, a question if you want. Okay, um, Siddharth, please. Thanks. Uh, I have a fairly elementary question. So in the, in the talk, did you tell us how we recover the metric structure of space-time, that is the amount of distance between different points instead of just the topology? Thank you for the question. No, I didn't. I, I, I just made the very, <laughs> very quick claim that a causal set can encode um, Lorentzian geometry, and I didn't tell you how. So the our uh, confidence that that's the case is based on a theorem, a, continue, a theorem in the continuum that says that if 
you know the causal order, that is all the information about which point events in, in this continuum space-time are in the causal past of which other point events, all of that, in, so if you like, just the light cone structure of the, of the space-time. If you know that, and you know the, the space-time volume element, in other words, the square root of minus g d4x, that, that, then you know the full geometry. There's some, there's some technical conditions for that theorem, but so the theorem is due to various people over the years, but Penrose, Hawking, and Malament are the main, main, through the sort of main results that lead to this theorem. So, um, and the, the space time has to satisfy certain causality condition. Um, so the idea is that a causal set is a, is a dis it contains the causal order information because that's exactly the, the, the order relation. And it contains the volume measure because you have the counting measure. It's not a continuum, but you can just count. So you have a counting measure, which gives you the volume measure. And that the theorem suggests is enough to give you the space time geometry, the full geometry on scales large compared with the discreteness scale. So it, it won't tell you the it won't tell you the the geometry on scales smaller than the discreteness scale, which is a, a hypothesized to be the Planck scale, because it can't. I mean you but on large scales compared to the discreteness scale, the <clears throat> order relation and the counting measure give you the full geometry. That's the idea. Can I just quickly follow up, Nick? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that helps. So just to be clear, when you talked about the counting measure, when I thought about those diagrams that you drew, um, there's no natural sort of background on which it's drawn, right? You could make them as sparse as you please. So right. I don't know how you would define a density of points without sort of a background measure. Right. Play. So it, it's um it, it's the I mean the the density is one <laughs> in natural units. So so that we don't know precisely what the we don't know precisely what the fundamental unit of four volume is. We think it's of order the Planck four volume, right? So that's the Planck length cubed times the Planck time, <laughs> roughly. Of all, that, so so that in fact that's a that's a concrete dynamical question for for causal set theory. What what is the fundamental volume in Planck units, <laughs> right? In centimeter, you know, in centimeter cubed seconds. That. It, something of order one is the hypothesis, the working hypothesis. Um, but it, it, but the idea is that sort of it's the other way around, right? The, the, there's a fundamental scale, and the density is one in fundamental units. But how how does that translate? You know, what is it in centimeters and, and seconds? That's a dynamical question that you know we can only answer once we have we know how how matter. Um, fits into the picture as per the previous question. So yeah, so you know, what is a centimeter in fundamental units? That's that's the question. What is what is Newton's constant in fundamental units? Those are those are hard dynamical questions that the theory will have to answer in the end. Uh, oh, can I answer so Nick, should I say more or can should I, I need, is it quick? I have a I have I do have a Q, so. Uh, okay, so I guess the only quick thing, and then I'll stop, is that. Um, so I guess if you already are making an assumption that there is this uh, notion of blank volume that's well defined, then you are sort of. There seems to be almost two space times here, right? There's one that's the supervenient space for our 
ordinary expedience. And then there's the other, which is the supervenient space for these points in a way. But maybe I'm getting myself confused. So I'll just stop there and thank you so much. OK, thanks, Siddha. Um, Mike, Mike Schneider has a question. Hi. Uh, so thank you for this talk. Uh, I found it very interesting. I have two questions, I think, and at least one of them is just born out of ignorance more than anything else. And so I was hoping you could fill it in. Uh, and that's, so the, the theorems that you gestured at um, all seem to have to do with um, sort of limit results on these stochastic processes. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent that sort of method is um, too blind to the things we care about uh, in these cosmological models. And what I have in mind here is something like, well, I'm often not interested in the long run probability that any particular um, stem will be there, but I'm interested in the relative frequencies that I'm getting around me about for these different structures. And so are there, is that just, there's a different program going on along the side that looks at those questions and your talk was centered on the long run stuff or is there a reason why, a specific reason why these are the sorts of results that you're presenting? Um, we don't know how to a even ask the question you're asking because, because general covariance, this label independence is, causes an enormous amount of, of trouble because th the sort of thing you would like to ask, and I agree that we would like to ask, I mean, that we should be asking, that we need, that we want to ask is, you know, given that my, let's say, my past was such and such, so that, you know, there, there was a stem which was like this, um, you know, say the, the, uh, the past which corresponds to, our, you know, our observable universe back to the, back to the Big Bang, say. Um, what's the probability that the in the future such and such will happen, right? So... So in other words, what's the probability of a particular stem given that there was a substem of a with a particular structure? Something like that, right? So that would be, it, it, those are conditional, you know, conditional probabilities. The problem with that is that it's what we call, it's, it's a bugbear of ours, we call it the this stem problem because there's no way you know, there's no covariant way to distinguish different copies of the same stem in a causal set. So you want, we want to know what happens here when our stem was such and such and, <laughs> and we want to know what's the future for us. But it, if you ask the question, well, let's, t so, Conditional probabilities in a stochastic model are, you know, they're, they're calculated by, by reducing the full sample space down to the sample space um, where, uh, of just the event, which is the condition, right? So you, you just throw away all the, all the causal sets that don't have that stem. But the problem is that there might be causal, there'll be causal sets in your event which have that stem in multiple copies here and here and here and here in the same causal set. And then you're asking, well, what's the probability that, you know, the future of one of these stems is, is something. But you don't want to know about the future of one of them. You want to know the, <laughs> the probability the future of our particular copy of that stem is. And that's something that I'm not even sure whether any of us have written that down in print anywhere because... It <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing. I mean, that it's embarrassing for us, but I think it's also embarrassing for everybody who's who is 
because of general covariance, it's if you're if you're it, if your model is random, if there's randomness in your model, whether it's quantum or classical, it's randomness. So it's not a deterministic model. Then you have to grapple with this, and you, and and you and your model is covariant. That is, it doesn't you know you, you're not allowed to use labels as physical, phys- you know, physically meaningful. Then you, 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 everyone will have this problem. So it's embarrassing for us, but it's embarrassing for everyone. But yeah, I, we don't know how to answer that. I mean, we've toyed with the idea of well, you have a marked stem, but what's the mark? You know, what's <laughs> anyway? Yes. So a, a fantastic question, and we, yeah, we we can't answer it. Well, no, thank you. This was uh, very interesting. Um, ex- the second question that I had is a, a quicker question, um, which is, well, may, maybe not quicker. It's quicker to state, I suppose. Um, in your previous answer, you mentioned the um, sort of global structure conditions in the background that get you from causal ordering to full-fledged metric or space-time. Um, and I wondered, just uh, in, in the classical GR context, there's a further kind of um, conventionalism that some, uh, say, closed time models have, where if you just move to a covering space that sort of unwrapped them, you can think of those two as conventionally paired with each other. So. Minkowski space-time rolled up in time versus unrolled. Um, and I'm wondering in, in the causal sets or causal set approach, do you ever talk about that sort of conventionalism? So you look at the, um, the, the bounce and you say, well, there could be a sense in which um, the bouncing model is just a covering graph in some uh, analogous sense to a single universe with a start and end? I think the answer is no, in the sense that causal sets can't accommodate closed causal curves or closed timeline curves at all. So if if the continuum picture has a closed causal curve or closed timeline curve in it, then a causal set cannot underlie it. it. There's no, you cannot read off the, the continuum information of a, a non-causal space-time from a causal set, even if you relax. So the definition of a causal set is a partial order and a partial order has a no cycle condition. But if you relax that condition, then even, th- even if you relax that condition, you, can't, you still can't get a continuum approximation with a closed a closed causal curve so so that the it, yeah it's it's a sort of it just doesn't work at all Every, a space time that you get from from a causal set has to has to satisfy this uh, this causality condition whether it's the, what whether it's the condition known as distinguishing or it's a slightly stronger condition of is called strong causality. That's an issue which I'm interested in. And I I have a feel, so the Malament theorem says that the distinguishing condition is sufficient in the continuum. You can, you can read off, you can get the, um, the conformal, the conformal geometry from the, from the continuum causal order. But I'm not sure whether that's true in the in the discrete case. I, 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 yeah, there's something there's something slightly unstable about the, about a call about a continuum space time which is distinguishing but not strongly causal, which may be you know the may be incompatible with the discreteness. But it's yeah something that I'd like to think about more when I get time. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, Dan Linford has the next question, please. Uh, yeah, right. So, uh, well, first, this, the, their talk was was great today. I really enjoyed 
the talk. But um, so there are philosophers who will take it as uh, sufficient to have time that you have both before and after relations, what they call B relations. And um, your, uh, so your causal sets obviously have something like that relation to find on them. What I'm wondering is really sort of like an elementary question, which is just something like, um, to what extent does the, um, so you have these, for example, you have periods in your, or regions in your, in your cosmological model where time breaks down in a sense. And I'm wondering how much of um, the traditional way that people have thought about time breaks down in um, for those for those causal sets if that makes sense yeah that, that, I, well I'm not a philosopher of time yeah and sure. I don't know but it maybe it's fair to say that there's at least two I mean it, at least time in general relativity seems to me to have two aspects one is order and the other is duration okay and to in a causal set order is retained but there is no duration i don't know whether that so uh, um yeah i don't uh, so I think that's really again. interesting. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, that's why uh, the other, I guess that's why the other um, uh, person asked the question, asked about how you get metrical structure from the, because you have to get back metrical structure at some level of description, even though you- Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, so there are two, at least two scenarios, you know, in, in, the, in the same causal set, you might have part of the causal set has a continuum approximation and part of it doesn't. So in the part that does, you have to get back metrical information. And, and the, you could say that the Malament, the penrose hawking Malament theorem says that if you have order and you have scale, mm -hmm. then you can get back the, all of the, the full metric. So, so there you would have, you have order, or you always have order, but you also, if there's a continuum approximation, then you get, you get scale by counting. So for example, you could tell how, how long a particular chain, a maximal chain between two, two causal set elements is just by counting, count, just count the length. Um, and so the, so you then that would that would be duration as well approximately. Yeah. Um, sure. But in the parts of the causal set which are not manifold like, you don't have metric. There's no continuum approximation. There is just order. That's all. There's no, and yeah, you don't need to recover anything because it's not manifold like. It's it's you know it's a realm beyond our ken. It's beyond the reach of our, you know of our experiments to date so yeah and there it's just the idea is that the physics is pure order interesting thank you dan um next up uh, david wallace please hi thank you nice um, question about the quantum side of this um i kind of think i can guess what the answer looks like but um i'm wondering how to relate the last comments you made about quantum mechanics to the Sort of initial diagrams you were drawing, which looked like a sort of univocal space time with um, you know, manifoldy regions and then um, causal regions that don't emit a manifold description and then non manifoldy regions. Presumably, my path integral, if I do this quantum mechanically, is going to include um, uh, you know, very different causal sets that, for instance, go non, non manifoldy at very different places or to very different degrees, and the whole thing is being put to superposition. So does that complicate the situation in any particular way? Or, or in practice, can I just assume there's enough decoherence that you can pretend the system's stochastic when you're um, treating things on these scales? Yes, in principle, it complicates things. And 
I mean, I can't even point to, you know, the usual, you know, toy models of decoherence <laughs> of dust grains by the, you know, micro background to say, yes, there will be decoherence between, between macroscopically different, you know, um, from co between causal sets which have macroscopically different um, continuum approximations. Although one would, I mean, of course, we hope so. Mm. And, you know, it, it may be, I mean, what we would like, I think, is a picture in which the causal sets which contribute significantly to the path integral all have, they agree on the epochs of continuum light behavior. So they're, they're approximated by the same um, continuum space time, but they're hugely different in the, you know, the deep quantum bits. And that doesn't matter because it's deep quantum bits and we don't need to get, yeah. get any continuum, um, continuum description there. Um, but yeah, whether, whether that is what the quantum dynamics will give us once we have it. Yeah. I obviously I'm hoping so, but yeah. Don't know. So, I mean, when you say contribute to the path integral, do you mean like contribute at all, or or, or or contribute when you're focusing on a particular region? I mean, I mean, are you expecting that somehow the dynamics is such there just won't be any significant weight on trajectories that, 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 that don't all fall within one particular classical description, or is it going to kind of break down into different classical descriptions, and it's just that they're going to hear from each other, so we might as well pretend it's stochastic? Um. I it seems very unlikely that it's going to they're they're going to um, there's just going to be one class of um, you know one continuum space time and they're all going to be close to to that. Yeah. So yeah, so I think we are we are going to have to uh, appeal to to um, to decoherence between between what I would I call events and what people in the decoherent histories literature called coarse grained histories so yeah so we would need to expect some of that yeah okay thanks thanks david um chris has been waiting a long time so i'm going to bump him yeah go ask your question please chris okay <clears throat> thank you uh so I have a question about the dynamics for past infinite causal sets you've been thinking about recently. And one remark you made at the very beginning when you, when you started to talk about these uh, ideas was that uh, if you think of the, or if you approach that problem by sort of starting in the middle, as it were, and then alternating, adding, uh, you know, events to the future and the past, then you would lose the possible identification of uh, that growth process with uh, some sort of becoming or a passage of time or something like that. And I, I was a little bit surprised to hear that because um, at, the, at, at the end of the, the article I wrote with Craig Callender about five years ago, we speculated about this. And we, the, the, the sort of the idea that we sketched there would be that in this case, you would in fact end up with two different epochs where you have becoming uh, toward the normal one, towards the future, and then the, the past one uh, sort of prior to the Big Bang, there would also be a sort of an epoch of becoming away, in a way directed away from that initial moment, so that what you would end up with would be sort of two epochs of becoming. And the fact that you alternate between them doesn't really matter because you might as well have chosen to sort of, you know, uh, label your birthing sequence with just the even numbers or the odd numbers or something like that. It's, it's still going to be in each of these two separate uh, uh, domains. It's going to be a, a, a perfectly um, well-ordered uh, sequence of, of, of growth, which I think you can individually associate with a, a sense of becoming or a passage of time, even though, of course, you know, in a way you lose the sort of the, the global one, I suppose. Uh, but that seems to me, so, you know, ideas like this seem to me perfectly viable. Uh, so what do you, what do you think about this? Oh, thank you, Chris. I 
should have known about your work with Craig, so apologies. Um, I, yes, so I'm an old stick in the mud when it comes to time, I suppose, in the sense that I just think there's one <laughs> direction for it. So what you're describing, I think, is that is that there's just two direct. I mean, there's a direction, yeah, forwards and a direction backwards from this big bang. Uh, so in in that sense, I think I wouldn't say then that this picture that I was that I was basing my discussion on that there's an epoch and then a punctuation and then another epoch and that epoch is after it's after the <laughs> the one before um i think that that's just not what you would you can't use those words and also have becoming i think away from the you know upwards away from the from the the big bang and downwards away from the big bang at least i find that yeah i, I think that's just a different kind of picture mm -hmm. yeah I, I i agree about that i think the interpretation of what i proposed would then that the right interpretation would be something like the birth of twin universes rather than some sort of transition from an earlier epoch through the Big Bang into a, a sort of a later epoch. Um, and there is, of course, the question whether you can have something like a, a growth dynamics, uh, a generalized form of growth dynamics, in the sense that you have a, a truly uh, infinite, totally ordered, um, you know, complete uh, uh, sort of model of, of, of becoming, inf past infinite and future infinite. But, but I think, you know, once you start to think about this, and this is what fascinates me about this material, is that there's so many, you know, possible models that you could end up with, some of which are not obviously phenomenologically distinct from what you would expect for our own universe. So how are you going to, for instance, distinguish, you know, the, 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 the single past finite uh, the universe we seem to inhabit from the birth of a twin universe or something like that or a, right. a triplet universe or yeah you know, so all of a sudden there be, you know you have all these options one thing i should perhaps mention is that um it's not quite what you've been asking but um one thing bruno and stav tried to look at I think they're both here by the way at least they said that they would come so but I can't see who's here so I, I think they're so I think they, they looked are, at yeah. a possibility of of a growth model in which the causal set elements can be born anywhere so so our alternating dynamics you know is it, it, it alternates past and future um, and sort of grows from the top and grows from the bottom um, but you, if you don't make such a condition, you can just have a causal set element being born in the middle, in between two cause elements that already exist. And of course, that's a reasonable thing to look at and to try. But the problem with that was that there, there was no way to take the limit. So there's no way to run that process to the end and get a causal set that the process is is an infinite causal set that that process is is tending to. That's the problem with that. I mean, if you only want to grow a finite universe, a finite causal set, that's fine. But if you if you want to run something which produces for you an infinite causal set, then we couldn't make that work. So, so it seemed like that wasn't an option. That you you did need to add things. To the past and the, you know, to the top and the bottom, which is it, you know, it's the the by the, you know, the fact that the causal relation is a binary relation. It's not a, you know, it's not a triple of points that are somehow related. It's, you know, it's a pair of points which are related. It's a binary relation on the on the set. So there's only ever <laughs> there's there's before and after. You know, there's there's 
there's you know above and below and and yeah that's that's it yeah, yeah great thank you very much yeah. i mean if i can put a finger on that it seems well first i think what chris is describing is what you described as conventional and maybe you had boring in mind kind of multiverse kind of picture of what's going on that you wanted to no 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 it wasn't really against. boring it's just that you know that it, <laughs> the idea that but I take it anything about the multiverse should be conventional was was funny to me. But um, but I take it in if if you tried to read what Chris and Craig were describing into the 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 infinite causal sets that you're thinking about and sort of imagining a post somewhere in one half time would be running in the direction of the arrows in the other half you'd have to have time running in the opposite you know contrary to the arrows. It's not like in the bottom that the arrows are pointing down, right? They're always sort of pointing up. So it's kind of built in that it's not like that in that sense. And I don't know if that's what you and Craig were kind of considering that that possibility. So we do have uh, one more question um, from um, An Antonia Hildebrand, please. Um, yes, you said that the elements of these sets are events and I was wondering how are events defined exactly in this context so which kind of things are ordered? Oh, that's a great question thank you. Um, I suspect I was a little sloppy <laughs> about the term event so so I should say to be more precise that the the elements of the set are atoms of space-time and they are if you like somehow the the building blocks of events they're 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 the smallest things that can happen I mean what does it mean for an atom to happen it means that the the atom comes into being so there's if you like something that happens <laughs> So the, the term event is, you know, it's it has many meanings, sort of colloquial meanings and and me, and specific meanings in mathematics. And so I think I probably conflated them all a little bit um, in a confusing way. So apologies for that. Um, so yeah, the it, at the very basic microscopic level of the causal set in itself, the space the the elements of the set are space time atoms. They're the 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 most basic entity that that space time is comprised of and the if you like the event meaning meaning the thing that happens that corresponds to that atom is the atom coming into being or becoming so that's one <laughs> one concept of event which is something that happens and then in the stochastic process which is the other framework that I was talking about this concept of event an event that's a that's a sort of term that's used in the you know in the um in the in the technical terminology that goes along with stochastic processes so an event is a subset of all the possible um histories of the stochastic process so if you think about so a simple case might be a, a random walk is a stochastic process, or let's say a random walk on the integers, right? And uh, an event, uh, uh, an example of an event is um, after 15 steps, the walker is um, within um, two steps of the uh, of of where it started, right? That's that's a that's an event. And it, there's a, a bunch of, of um, trajectories for the walker that satisfy that, and there's a bunch that don't. So you put all the ones that satisfy it into a set, and that's called an event. And there, it, it, so that's just one example, but there, uh, and to, all together, those events form an algebra, an algebra of events. So in, that's the other way I was using this terminology of, it, of event in, in the talk. So... Maybe I, yeah, I wasn't clear to, to distinguish those, those things. Okay, and uh, what's meant by um, space-time atoms? 
exactly, if I may ask that? They are fundamental units of reality. So you mean atoms, like, or is it something? I don't mean atoms as in, you know, regular atom, I, atoms of matter. I mean atoms as in indivisible, indivisible pieces of space-time. That's... Okay. So atom, you, you know, in its in its um, etymological sense of being indivisible. So it's yeah, the smallest and indivisible units of of space time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to abuse my hosting and chairing privileges. I think to ask the last question of. This, this series, um, which is actually kind of a follow-up to Siddharth's question. Um, so, so, but let me ask the question, so this, this way, so we, there's, this, there's a density of the nodes or the, the events of sort of one. What does, so I understand what that means in the case, in the situation where, uh, you know, I understand sort of empirically, at least, you know, what that then means in the case where the causal, the reg regime where the causal set is being approximated by the continuum. But how would you understand that in the sort of non-manifold, like sort of parts of the causal set? Um, yeah, does that make sense? I think that I think yeah. that's kind of getting to what he was sort of asking. Yeah, okay. another way of getting at what he's asking. Right. I think it doesn't have a meaning. I mean, the density is. It only has meaning in the discrete continuum correspondence. So when the causal set is not manifold, like. It has no, there is no density. I mean, the only thing, the only thing you can say is that it's locally finite. So in that sense, it's, disc, you know, it's discrete. So there's no accumulation, you know, there's no, there are no two causal set elements with infinitely many elements in between them. So it's, it, there's the discreteness, but there's no, yeah, there's no density as such in, in, it for parts yeah. of the causal set that are not manifold though. I think okay I think that yeah I, I kind of that's kind of what I expected you to say and I think I would say from, sort of think about it from that point that this density postulate is a postulate about how to um, um, how to relate the underlying theory the causal set theory you know to the continuum space-time you know that that we experience so it's a sort of postulate about how to reduce um a, Space time to a causal causal set, and then in a case where it doesn't reduce, then it's not actually in play. That's right. So another way to say it is that we like to say that the discreteness is Planckian. It's a Planck steel discreteness, but that has no meaning for the causal set in itself. You just have a causal set. It's a discrete thing. It doesn't have any scale. There's no. But for a causal set which has a continuum approximation then we would say, well, we experience the causal set in this way. And the, 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 yeah, the, in the correspondence between the approximating continuum and the causal set, then the density comes into play and the, and the fact that it's at Planckian scales is, is meaningful in that context, but not, not in general, I mean, not, yeah, cool. not otherwise. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Faye. I mean, once again, that was really um, great. And, um, My well, pleasure. Thank you on the base on behalf of everyone, although there's people can thank you in the chat as well. And um, once again, thanks to everybody who's been um, coming and thanks to all our speakers, um, some of whom are here today as well. Um, this has been a great series. I'm afraid, um, well, Chris put up the slide last week at the end of his talk that we should have here that says, that's all folks. But of course, if you missed any or you want to relive any of it, you can go to our website or our YouTube channel, um, also the center's website, um, and you can see videos of all these talks. Okay, thanks everybody um, and goodbye.